All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started here. So welcome everybody. Um, we're here on behalf of Allstate to present you guys sedated. Uh, quick introductions, I'm Simeon Coudier. I'm the project lead on the sedated project. Um, I'm also a lead application security engineer at Allstate. Uh, joined by my colleague, Dennis Kennedy. Uh, he's the lead developer on the sedated project and he's also an application security engineer at Allstate. Uh, quick agenda for what we're gonna talk about today. Um, first, we'll go through the problem statement. We'll talk a little bit about the whys. You know, why are we talking about this? What is the problem statement? We'll go into the solution. Uh, we'll do some demos. We'll show you some source code. Uh, go through some of the processes that we coupled the source code with. Then we're going to get a little bit into performance and future goals. And then um, talk about open sourcing. Okay, so I wanted to start with OWASP Top 10. Uh, hopefully, everybody's heard of that. Uh, number three in particular, sensitive data exposure. So this is when your application deals with sensitive data like PII, PHI, PCI data, or anything that you consider within your company to be sensitive uh, data, restricted, confidential data, anything like that. Um, so it's on the list because you should be protecting it properly. Um, whether it be in transit, when you're transmitting it across the line, you should be doing it securely or when you're storing it, you should be storing it securely and you should have proper access control mechanisms in place for that data. So no, it's number three on the list, it's important, and we're gonna tie this together. You know, why are we talking about this and our solution uh, to address some of the, you know, the problem statement. So I wanna talk real quick about um, a company, uh, two exploits that they had. So May 2014, this company uh, had an exploit where they uh, had 50,000 driver's license data leaked. Uh, and then in October 2016, um, unfortunately, they had 57 million users' data leaked and 600,000 driver's license um, data. Does anybody know what company this is by chance? <laughs> anybody besides Joe in the back? Who is it, Joe? Wow. It's, it's, it's Uber. Um, <laughs> So this is Uber. Um, so we're not here to pick on Uber or rolling this together. We're trying to secure our data, right? But we wanted to talk about the particulars of what actually happened in, the, in both of these exploits. And this leads right into the problem statement that we wanted to talk about today. So how, how exactly did this happen? So in May 2014, their database key, unfortunately, was on a publicly accessible GitHub page. Uh, the hacker got hold of it, found it, and in they go. So they ac that's how they access the data. And then in 2016, again, it was a database key. They had the database key, but this time it was inside of a private, private repository. But the hacker was able to gain access to that repo, and once they gained access to that repo, there was the key sitting in their repo. So we want to talk about this in particular, this was a, um, you know, a, this is a database key. This is like the master, you know, key to your kingdom, right, or your data. Uh, it's sensitive data, and you want to ha have, you know, defense in depth. You want to have multiple layers that an attacker has to jump through to gain access. So with, with sensitive data like this, um, we definitely would recommend keep it out of your repo. Uh, things like database keys, uh, private keys, passwords, user, anything like that. Store it somewhere else. Um, in this instance, you know, maybe on the server that the app's running on, maybe you have an environment variable where this key is sitting, or somewhere else, uh, but not in the source code. So this leads into our problem statement that we wanted to talk to you about today. How do we prevent sens sensitive data from being stored in Git? So data like this, or passwords, or digital certificates, things like that. How do we prevent that from being stored in Git? So the solution that we're here uh, today to present uh, is Sedated. So Sedated stands for Sensitive Enterprise Data Analyzer to Eliminate Disclosure. Um, I want to talk about the flow of Sedated. How does Sedated work? What exactly does it do? Um, so in this diagram here on the left-hand side, you have a developer, and on the right-hand side, you have your, your Git server. Um, 
in this example, this is GitHub Enterprise. This could be GitLab, or this could just be a Git server that's running. So the developer's coding their code, right? They're constantly coding and pushing things to their repository. So in this example, the developer codes something, it follows the yellow arrow, pushes new code. Instead of it going straight into the repository, it's gonna hit sedated, the black box. Now, if you're already familiar with this, uh, it's a pre-receive hook running on the Git instance. So technically, that's what sedated is. It's a pre-receive hook. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna fire before it goes to the repository. And it's gonna scan all the deltas. So whatever code the developer's pushing, um, it's gonna scan that. And it's gonna see if there's sensitive data in there. If there is no sensitive data, it'll follow the green arrow and it'll get pushed into the repository. That's happy path, right? But if it does identify sensitive data in this push, it'll forcibly reject it. That's gonna follow the red arrow. And that code with that sensitive data will not end up in the repository. And again, that's the problem statement that we're after today with the solution. With that, I'll pass it over to Dex. Sweet. Thanks, Emian. The, this not that I'm aware of. It's a it's a pre-receive hook, so it sits in the server. So it's on the server side. Forcibly yeah. runs against okay. all pushes. Yeah. yeah. All right, and let's take a look at our demo here. Okay, so what we're gonna do? Um, this is a uh, pretty empty repo. Our demo repo. We just got a readme in it. Uh, we've got a clean working tree. Um, and what we're going to do is we're just going to create um, a simple file, uh, just hello world Python file. And you can see it over in the uh, our text editor over there. Jump over there and we'll just throw some code in. Uh, we'll do a, just a print, uh, simple print statement, hello world. So this is going to be a clean, this is a happy path. So this is no sensitive data. Uh, if you've had, got sedated turned on on your repo, um, uh, and this is what's going to happen. So you're going to do your uh, git add, um, and then you're going to do your git commit. Uh, an important note is the sedated won't fire on th this git commit. Um, so it's not going to fire here. This is just creating the, the commit ID. Uh, and once we do that, now we've got the commit ID. And now is when sedated is going to fire when we do the git push. Uh, so we're going to do the push right there. Uh, and then once we try to push, this is where sedated is going to scan the, for deltas for anything, any sensitive data. Uh, and if there's no sensitive data, you get this happy credential panda right there. <laughs> so they, it's pretty clear, and you can see on the bottom, the push was accepted. So this was a uh, happy path. So everything's good, good to go. So on this one here, uh, we've got the uh, uh, sad path here. This one is the sad path, okay. So on this one, um, we're going to actually add a hard-coded credential in it, and we'll see what happens. So we'll add a creds.config file, create it. Uh, we'll jump back there, uh, and we will we'll add just a hard-coded password. So we're going to say our password is my password. One, two, three. Yep, we're saved. Jump back into the terminal, and we're going to do the same as before. Go to your git add, git commit creating the commit ID, and again, uh, sedated's not going to fire on the commit, uh, on this commit. Uh, it's only going to fire when you try to push it up to the server. So we can go and uh, do add commit. There we go. And now when we do our git push, you're going to see uh, sedated fire again. Uh, but this time, when it fires, um, you'll see a, a much different error message. And you've killed the credential panda. Now he's, now he's dead. <laughs> So you can see uh, in the error message, uh, we're actually showing the developer the uh, commit ID uh, that has, because you can push multiple uh, commit IDs in it. So the commit ID, the file, and then the actual violation itself, uh, we're outputting straight to the developer right away in the, uh, to the console. We show them how many violations, and then uh, clearly a push rejected. Uh, and then another handy thing is at the bottom here, you can add in your, um, your organization's URL uh, for instructions on exactly how you want the developer to remediate uh, when violations are found. And you can see in the bottom, it took 17 milliseconds for this to run. 
uh, to run through. Uh, and with that, we'll pass it back over to Simeon. So one thing we wanted to talk about as we're open sourcing this and going through that is how we combine this code that we're showing you with processes. Um, this code on its own uh, will do things, right? And it's gonna look for things. But we married this up with some processes that we're gonna walk you through that um, really create an overall robust solution to uh, this problem. You'll see uh, here in a second why this is necessary. So we wanted to talk about those uh, processes with you and explain those. Uh, one in particular, the whitelist process. So this is false positives. Um, if you go and you turn this thing on in your organization, it is inevitable that you're gonna have false positives. Um, no matter how extensive the regexes are, um, you're probably gonna have instances where it you know, flags one and it's a false positive. So we need to create a way to deal with that. So this is our whitelist flow that we've uh, developed um, within it. So we wanna walk through that. So uh, on the left-hand side here, you have a developer. Uh, he's pushing a commit number one, commit one, two, three. And let's say that that has a false positive in it. Something that sedated thinks it's a password, but it's not. Um, it's gonna get rejected, so number two, uh, sedated will not allow it to go into the repository. Um, but this is a false positive. So the developer sees this, he sees the error message, and he says, this is not actually a password. Uh, this was flagged incorrectly. Um, so the next step is the developer can go, uh, number three, they can raise a pull request into the whitelist file. So we actually have a whitelist file. Um, it's just a text file. You put the commit ID in there, and you raise this pull request. Now, on the repository, and, th and this is kind of part of the process that we're you know, coupling this with, we have the permissions set up on that repository such that, at least for us at Allstate, um, the developers themselves do not have right access to this. So they can't whitelist themselves. And that's intentional on our part. So we have a permission set up. They can raise a pull request. They can request this. Um, but only the application security team can actually approve that. So that's number four. So the developer raises his pull request. And he says, for this commit ID, this is a false positive. Number four, the security team reviews it and looks at it and checks if they agree that it's a false positive. Uh, if we agree that it's a false positive, we go ahead and approve it and merge it. And then immediately after doing that, the developer uh, can go to number five and just re-push it again. So they go ahead and they push one, two, three, and immediately uh, Sedated will see this is a whitelisted commit ID, and it'll go ahead and accept it. Sweet, yep, and now we're gonna go through a, kind of a step-by-step -step of uh, what this looks like in action. Uh, so we're going to pick up where we left off before. We're gonna create another file. Um, and this time, uh, we're gonna add something that could be a false positive in here. And say password equals password. No quotes. And then we'll save that. We'll jump back into the terminal. And then we will go ahead and do the same thing we did before. We'll do our get add and commit. Uh, we'll run that, get our commit ID. And now when we run the actual uh, git push, it's gonna be rejected the same as before. Um, but this time, uh, the developers, he's gonna see the exact same message um, as before. This time the uh, developers can be like, well, wait a minute, this, this isn't a, this isn't a, this isn't a, a real hard-coded credential, this is a false positive. They give password as a variable. They see it was rejected, so now what they need to do um, to do their pull request, they need to make some, some sort of documentation uh, that the security team can uh, review, which is what we put into uh, one command, which is kind of a chain of a couple commands. Uh, but we do a git format patch, um, which is going to create a patch.txt file, um, which will give some context to the lead or whoever's uh, reviewing um, this pull request. And uh, it's going to also do a push. And then it's going to create, uh, it's take all that output from the push and uh, put it into a uh, hookout.txt file. So this one command is going to create two files um, for them to include in their pull request. Uh, so that they can use as documentation. So when we go ahead and run this, um, you'll see the exact same output as before, um, but this time there were two files that were created that they can uh, submit for their documentation. So uh, we'll go ahead and jump into Finder. And you can see uh, 
There's the hookout file. <coughs> it's in the desktop directory. So we've created that file with that command, and then we've also created the uh, patch.txt file. And you can point these wherever you want. You can customize the command to do uh, whatever you would like. Uh, but it's basically those two files that we use for the um, documentation. And then we copy the commit ID up there that says in this commit. And we'll jump into, um, in this case, GitHub, into our GitHub repo under the commit whitelist file. Then we're going to go ahead and add that commit ID um, that it shows us that it had a violation. Uh, you can include in there uh, whatever commit message you want to go with it, saying it's the reason why it's not a hard-coded credential. And then in here, you don't want to commit, don't want to allow them to commit directly to master. So you create a branch, they submit that. Um, and then now, in this portion of it, we'll go ahead and submit our documentation. Um, and then wait for it, and boom, black box of read action. <laughs> and then we'll go ahead and add the, uh, the hookout.txt file as well. Throw that in there and drop it in. So now they've got their documentation to go along with their pull request. They go ahead and create it. And this is where the developer's job stops. And now you would be the um, AppSec engineer or whoever you want reviewing these pull requests is going to go in and look at these files. This is what was included in the patch.txt file. And this will have a lot more context into exactly what was included in their commits. It'll have the commit ID, the file, the violations, and things of that nature. And then the hookout.txt file is helpful because it will show the AppSec engineer exactly what the developer was seeing um, in their error message. So there's no uh, miscommunication or developer trying to explain something to the AppSec engineer that uh, is maybe hard for them to uh, verbalize. So if the AppSec engineer reviews it, says it's all good, they can go ahead and merge it. I mean, if not, they can put some comments in there, reject it, what have you. Uh, but if it's all good, they'll go ahead and click merge. And then um, they will add uh, that it's verified, put whatever comments you want the, them to put in there. They'll merge it. And then as soon as you see the pull request successfully merged and closed, um, the developer will be able to push their code again. They don't have to do anything additional. They don't have to rewrite anything. Um, and they can go ahead and just run uh, their git push command again. And then as soon as they run that, uh, you'll see that their message will be a little bit different, but their push will be accepted. You'll see that it has been um, whitelisted. You'll see that. It shows the uh, commit ID that was whitelisted, and then, of course, that the push uh, was accepted. So it's, it's that simple. It's pretty straightforward. It's just a standard pull request um, that an AppSec engineer reviews um, to get around that. And then, Simi, you wanted to add something to that? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, we're going to talk about that, actually. We're going to show you some of the source code. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, just a quick comment on this we wanted to mention. You know, there's always room for improvement. Um, so here uh, in our instructions, we're very clear for us in our instructions link to the developer, um, you know, make sure that this pull request that you're raising is truly a false positive. We don't want them actually taking and generating documentation like this that actually has a password in it then creating a pull request and attaching a file to that pull request that has a password in it. That's what we're trying to prevent in the first place, right? Now, there's room for growth here. Um, we're, we're working on things like maybe instead of having them attach that file to the pull request, we have them put it on a secure server with very limited access, you know, that the only the application security team sees just in case they don't follow the instructions and there is a password in it. Um, so we, that's a caveat. Room for growth, right? Room for improving there. We just want to mention that. Exactly. I mean, you would hope common sense would kick in, and if they wouldn't submit a pull request for something that was a hard-coded credential, but you can't always rely on that. So here's the to look at the source code. Uh, just kind of a brief snippet, snippet of it, um, of the kind of the meat and potatoes uh, of how it's working. Uh, you can see line 89 up at the top there. It's just looping through all the commit IDs, so you can have 1, 10, 20, 100, however many commit IDs are included in the push. It's going to go through each one of those. And then line 90 is where it's going to go through all the deltas. So everything that was added in that push, um, it's going to uh, grep against the, uh, the regex list, um, which we mentioned earlier. Uh, and it's, if it flags anything, um, it'll check it um, in lines 99 and 100 to see if it's in the whitelist file. Uh, if it is in the whitelist file, then it'll uh, add, it, add the uh, whitelisted commit, um, change the variable, break out of the uh, loop, and then um, jump to the next commit ID. Uh, and then from there, uh, if it's not 
uh, if it's not whitelisted, we'll jump down to uh, 107 and below where it's going to add it to the violation list. It's going to have a different output, um, print out the file name, and then uh, add to the file violation and total violation variables. And then uh, back up to line 90 where we mentioned the regexes. This is kind of a brief snippet of some of the regexes we've got for it. Right now we're at uh, 75 or so regexes. Um, we're always looking to add and make them better. Um, these are just kind of some, some general ones uh, that we've got. And we're always trying to, like I mentioned, add and improve, um, modifying them. Uh, but that's kind of a, that can be a tricky thing to do when you're messing with so many regexes so you don't mess up something else, um, which is why we've, uh, we've created the unit testing suite. Um, and with this, uh, we can run this uh, whenever we need to. Anytime we make a change to a regex, we can uh, then run our regex unit test cases, run those against it. Right now, we've got over 400 um, test cases that include uh, pushes that should, should be accepted and pushes that should be rejected. So we're checking to make sure we're catching what we're supposed to and not catching what we don't want to catch. So, any, so we can make changes and modifications uh, to our regexes with confidence that we're not breaking something else that we had not intended. And in addition to that, we also have the uh, integration tests for the uh, sedated itself, the script. Uh, so anytime we make changes to that, we can run our integration tests, make sure nothing was broken, make sure all the whitelist functionality is there, make sure that the, uh, the regexes work as supposed it, they're supposed to, make sure it's rejecting and accepting uh, and so forth. Um, and what we're doing at Allstate is we got a, uh, we have a Jenkins job that kicks off anytime we make changes um, to our production repo um, that's going to run all the tests, uh, all these tests um, via webhooks. So if we get anything negative back, we'll know to, what we need to do to, to fix it and to uh, not have it in production. So implementation uh, of Sedated, there's three levels. You can start enterprise level, which is going to turn it on just force turn it on on every single repo in your entire organization. Um, you can also turn it on at the org level, like if you have a specific org within your enterprise that uh, maybe deals more with sensitive, sensitive data, API keys, things of that nature, than, um, than others, you could just turn it on to that specific org, or you can go as granular as uh, the repo, just turn it on individual repos themselves. Um, and as Simeon mentioned already, it is a, a git pre-receive hook so anywhere um, that you can enable a git pre-receive hook, you can use sedated. Uh, so it doesn't have to be GitHub, it can be GitLab, Git, um, whatever else. If you can use a git pre-receive hook, you can, you can leverage this. Um, and in addition to that, uh, since it is a pre-receive hook, they've got a five second timeout. So you've got a five second window for this whole thing to run through uh, before it hits a timeout. So that's why in performance, uh, it's, it's very high priority for us. Um, so we scripted a lot of it with performance in mind. Yeah, so we have some numbers here we'd like to share with you. This is just based on uh, what, you know, our server, our GitHub Enterprise server and how it performed. Um, so there's two in particular here I kind of wanted to show you. Uh, the first one in green, so this is an example of one file, and that one file has nearly 640,000 lines of code in it, deltas, change, changes in that one file. To put that in a little bit of context, um, I don't know if I'd code that much code in five years total. Uh, that's a ton of code, 640,000 lines of code for me to just knock out. But let's pretend you did. Um, send that through sedated, it's gonna take 2.2 seconds based on our numbers that we've been running. Uh, well within the five second window. So it's, it's pretty fast uh, the way it's performing right now. Another number I wanna throw out is in orange. Uh, so this is 250 files, and um, each file has 200 lines of code change. Um, again, I'd say this is a fairly obnoxious use case. You know, when was the last time you waited to commit, you know, after 250 files that you modified? Why didn't you commit sooner? I would say that's, you know, but let's say you did. Um, that's 50,000 lines of code total, and it takes, it, it, can, it can bump through our 75 regexes, scan all this code for sensitive data, and it did all that in 0.8 seconds. Um, so it's performing, it's performing pretty good uh, for us. It meets all our needs. Um, any average use case, I would say, it, it's well within the limit. Now, we did want to mention if it's not within the limit. Let's say we hit that five-second window. 
Um, you're going to have to put a little, a little bit of effort in to hit that five second window. But let's say you did. Maybe an example of it is, is you, take a, you take a repository and you clone it. And then you take that code and you copy it over to another repository and you, you push it. Well, now Sedated is scanning all the deltas and we're talking about a brand new fresh repository and that you just copy and paste it you know, from one to another. Um, there might be a lot of code in there. We did set up, uh, along with um, commit ID whitelisting, we set up repo whitelisting. So there is the ability for this other repository for you to put it into a repo whitelist file and Sedata will see it inside of there and it will not scan the deltas. Now, use this sparingly. I'd highly recommend that if you do this, you know, do some sort of offline checks and balances to make sure that the repository doesn't have sensitive data in it before you push it. Um, there's other solutions to this. Um, there's Truffle Hog, for instance, you know, that can scan it. You could, you know, scan it with Truffle Hog so that you have some level of confidence if there's sensitive data in it. Uh, but the point is, um, you can get, you know, past this five second window, this issue, um, by whitelisting the repository. And with that, we're going to kind of go back to where we started. Um, so we're open sourcing sedated. Uh, we're excited to be able to do that and have this opportunity. Um, part of the reason we're excited about that, so we're coupling up with OWASP, turning it into a project. Um, that's in the works right now and open sourcing it. Not only to get it out there for people to use, um, but also there's room for growth, right? And there's room for us to improve this thing. And so we want to get it out there and hopefully have others contribute to this and make it better and use it. Um, so we're excited about that. Yeah, and we've got some future goals for this as well. Um, but before I jump into those, uh, just so I um, just wanted to mention that this is a preventative control, not a detective control. So it's not going to go through your entire Git history on every push. It's just going through those deltas, just so, just to be clear, just about it's preventing new credentials or hard-coded things from getting added uh, into your repos. Uh, and with that, uh, we've got some good future goals uh, in mind. Uh, we'd really love the community support with. Uh, we're really excited to get this out, get you guys involved. Um, one of the things, we're always looking to make it more performant, right? As we mentioned, the five second uh, timeout, five second window. Uh, there's ways we know it could be better, it could be faster, it could work better. Um, and for any ideas, for any improvements on that, we're really um, hoping to get some, uh, some community support with and feedback, working on improving the, the regexes, maybe even um, enhancing them with some sort of intelligence engine. That would be pretty awesome. Uh, even customizing the regexes for, uh, if it's a Java file, then we'd use the Java reg regexes. If it's a, a JavaScript file, use JavaScript regexes or um, what have you, YAML files, config files, so you can really minimize your false positives in your workload there. Uh, and we're also looking to add test cases. That's a pretty simple thing, just, just a string of um, something you don't want it to catch, something you do want it to catch, um, making sure it catches those things. Uh, things of that nature. Um, well, thanks for joining us. Uh, please be sure to keep an eye out for the uh, new sedated OWASP uh, project. Um, enjoy the rest of AppSec. I think we have time for questions. We do. I am curious about the ability to customize this. Yeah. Where I work, we have lots of different authentication tokens and mechanisms. So yeah, there are we do things too. <laughs> that we that may only be specific to our org. So how friendly is it to adding more regexes? That literally just look like an array of regexes. Is that that's all there is right now? Or uh, do I have to modify that code versus you, a config to get a custom uh, search or regex a pattern. Um, you could you could modify them, uh, the regexes however you want. Like if you only wanted to catch certain things, certain strings, you can you can wipe out all the regexes we have in there now and just have it for your spe very specific, very customized. Um, you can tailor it to your needs, and it's just going to catch those, and it's going to have that exact same behavior. Okay. Um, you can modify the regexes to even one, if you want. You just want to catch this one thing. Yeah, but that regex list look like it's embedded in the code of the the project itself versus like an additional config file somewhere where it would look at that in addition to whatever like a general so it, config it is, or it binary. Is a config file. It's like separated from the actual code that does the scanning. 
Okay. So you can freely modify that file without touching the actual source code of Sedated. Good. So yeah. I don't want to break the, <laughs> the app itself <laughs> from messing with the regex. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep, yeah. and there's there's error messages as well. If the regexes do break, it'll flash something up on the console that'll show you that the hey the regexes are broke. So you'll have immediate feedback with that as well. Any other questions? I think we have time for another one or two. No. Okay. Cool. Thanks again. Great. Thank you.